very good to be here. Um, well, I think format is totally interactive, so you can, uh, uh, I've got different segments where we'll stop from time to time and really engage in dialogue and debate all the way through. Um, just to continue introducing myself, so I um, got my PhD at Stanford Business School in the early 90s, and so I think, although I was really coming at it as an economist, sitting in, in the Bay Area in the early 90s, I got really interested in how technology changes industries, and then how those, what that industry shift means for companies, their strategies, and how they organize. And so for the last you know, five, 10 years, I've been a little bit like a kid in the candy shop in that we've just seen wave after wave of digital, digital technologies, right? From e-commerce, sharing economy, mobile apps, blockchain, hitting industries. And I would say, um, although I'm very interested in sort of digital overall, just because it shakes up industries and you see a lot of interesting challenges for companies, I usually haven't gone super deep on particular technologies. Um, but AI is something, as it, it sort of came along, has been sort of increasingly grabbing my sort of imagination and I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And um, I have you know, sort of the great, I guess, privilege in, in being part of the NCIAD community and helping lead it is to travel along and have dialogues like this all over the world. And you just can't help but notice sort of like two things that happened. One, over the last three, four years, as much as digital and computers have been around you know, since you know, decades, somehow um, in the last few years, digital sort of shot up the CEO agenda. Like, so suddenly places like Davos, it wasn't just a side topic, it was increasingly like the main topic. I mean, even with Brexit and Trump, Still, the, the level of intensity, whether it's anxiety or opportunity, around digital was really big. Right? So now it's like investing in this, and you keep thinking, well, eventually it's gonna run out of steam. Um, but then, you know, a couple of years ago, this AI thing comes, and it, it just seems to reinforce that. So again, um, here's just, you know, just from a pure social point of view, this is, this is like some um, social listening data I got from Microsoft I'm working with. This was um, like tweets mis mentioning cloud, you know, you got you know, maybe topping out at about you know, 100,000 tweets. This is you know, virtual reality, you know, 400,000 or so maybe tweets in a, in a hot period. And, and this is AI. You know, we're talking about tens of millions, right? So just the level of chatter around AI has been pretty stunning. And the interesting thing about the, whatever the algorithm they were running is they also pulled out sentiment. Right, so, so does this tweet seem to be like really excited, someone selling their stuff, or is it like you know, anxious and worried and, and, and critical? And you can see, again, if you compare this, there's a lot of emotion as well wrapped up in this topic. And, and, and we know, you know that partly comes from just this whole thing about what's our identity as humans and is this challenging it? I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's one thing, we're all kind of getting used to disruption. But it's you know, one thing if you're disrupting the encyclopedia industry or maybe the music industry. Clearly it's another thing if you're claiming to disrupt all of humanity. And so again, but again, part of you know, what I, I, I see my role is as, as an academic is to get out there, have the discussions, but then also to try and step back and say, okay, what's really going on? What's, what's the hype? What's the reality? Just trying to make sense of it. Um, from having seen other waves, um, trying to find people who are really, you know, close to the phenomenon um, and, and, and get their, their insight. So this is, for those who don't know, this is uh, my, I'm based on the French campus, so that's uh, one of our few sunny days. <laughs> it's not always like that. Um, so I guess part of my, let, let's, I'm sort of curious where you guys are coming at. So I'm going to ask two things. One is sort of what kind of exposure do you have to AI, but also what kind of questions are on your mind? I'll, I'll share some of the, the kind of questions I have. But um, first of all, like on a four-point scale, like so who's, if you're a one, if you don't really, you're coming here because you know, AI for you is something you see in like Star Trek and you're kind of trying to figure out what it's about, that's like one. Two is actually, yeah, you're trying to keep up on AI, but please don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> um, number three is, yeah, I'm kind of into it and I could, I could explain it to somebody, or at least parts of it. 
And number four would be, hey, AI is my life, right? You know, I'm, I'm in an AI startup or <laughs> um, I, I studied AI um, as a degree. So, so who's like, who's a one? You know, just like, yeah, no problem. So here to find out a little bit. Okay, who's a two? Sort of, you know about it. Don't, don't ask, don't, don't put you up here. Who's number three? Who actually likes to, yeah, so people talk about it. All right, who's four? Who's like living the, so this is good. All right, so who you I talk to, just you guys, what are your, what are your backgrounds? Where are you coming from? Yeah. NCID MBA. Yes. And what do you do in AI? Uh, we are startups. Yep. Boom. Together. <laughs> <laughs> what what space? Uh, real estate. Real estate. All right. Excellent. So we'll we'll see if we can work you into the conversation. And you, we talked earlier. You studied AI as an undergrad, and you now work. Yes. So I'm, uh, I I studied AI. Uh, I did my PhD there. Um, I am now working for a research institute, which basically deals with Okay, so we can really uh, get those kind of different perspectives. So that's great. So we have both the sort of the hardcore engineer and the sort of entrepreneurs, and that's um, the AI is a great ecosystem of different players. The only, the only, the only community that's sort of more diverse is probably blockchain. Right. So if you if you, if you deal with the blockchain people, they're like all over the place. But that, that's not today's talk. Um, what kind of Questions do you have? I'll, I'll throw one out. So I'm often wondering, is same or different, right? You know, we've seen wave and wave, you know, is, is there something particularly different about AI relative to blockchain or mobile? Um, is, is there something unique about it? So that, that's one of my questions. Other people have questions you're hoping to hear about? Or... Yeah. Mm. Great. An expert, yeah. To what extent do you need to be an expert? And, and so, how that's. that's losing interest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and then, well, <laughs> how can I learn enough about AI that I won't, won't be the one that's displaced? That's, that's the, it's a defensive play. <laughs> that's good. Uh, I mean, there's always a, I mean, one of the funny things, well, one of the important things, also, if you're leading change, you know, so any of these big changes have, as from a strategy point of view, has elements of threat and opportunity, right? And, and that's just the fact. But we know, if, you know, if you're leading and if your whole organization is gripped by fear about disruption, it's not a great emotional space <laughs> to respond, usually. It doesn't get you that far. Whereas, obviously, somehow having that sort of opportunity mindset makes people more proactive. And so I think that's a, certainly an interesting thing, again, one of the things that's a bit different about AI is sort of the level of anxiety it brings to, 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 to some people. Uh, okay, cool. Um, another always big question to ask about any of these technologies is the timing, right? How fast? And again, it's, it's actually not often not that, it's relatively easier to have a view of what's going to happen in 50 years, right? So, you know, okay, in 50 years, will, you know, do we think that we'll have autonomous cars? Seems you know pretty clear. Will we have it in you know three you know the, what's the you know if I if I'm actually designing products at Renault or BMW, I don't care about 50 years. I want to know will I get a return on investments to five, and that's usually the that that's really tricky. And, and so for me, I definitely maybe I shouldn't raise expectations that I'm going to answer all these questions. But these are certainly, um, you know, big questions. You know, the timing question is one of the most important, and we can um, probe that. Definitely going to vary by industry and application, right? So it's not, not some simple thing. All right, so are we okay? As I said, stop me any time. All right, so let's go. And so um, one, one thing, though, is, of course, there's always a mix of hype and reality. And then, you know, especially people are over, people, you know, the classic thing that, you, you hear, and it's true, people tend to overestimate how much change there'll be in the short run and sort of miss some of the bigger, more fundamental changes, and, and that, that's often true. So anyway, the first thing I'm, you're always trying to do is cut through the hype, because of course the media has a huge bias, which is they're trying to write things to get your attention. And of course all the stuff around social media, as we know, does that too. So you're, you know, you're always trying to step back and say, okay, well, just because there's tens of millions of tweets doesn't mean necessarily anything. So 
One of the oldest things in strategy, because strategy always has this problem, too much talk that might or might not get translated into action. Right? So just because it's in a PowerPoint presentation doesn't mean it's going to be happening on the street. So one of the things we always say in strategy is look at actual resource allocations. Simplest one is finance, but again, time, people, anything valuable, how's it being allocated? And again, the smarter the, the person doing the investing or the allocating, the more information there is. So again, what, you know, one of the things you would typically look at, not infallible, but you would look at, well, you know, these venture capital people, they've got a fair amount of experience. They've seen different technology waves. That's all they're supposed to be doing is figuring out, is this technology good? Does this company have a play in this industry? That's their role on the planet, at least when they're at work. So again, um, yes, is there herd behavior and stuff? Sure, but, okay, this would be data on early stage um, investments in, um, in, in AI, especially machine learning, but artificial intelligence overall. Um, and you can see this is seed, early stage, late stage. And you can see it ramping up. Um, that's just number of startups. Um, and then here's the other one, which is looking at how much is being invested, and you know, pushing up towards um, up and over five billion. And again, what you can see is that you, what you'd expect, right? So you notice that by 2017, yeah, there's a lot of seed, but you know, numbers, but the big money is in these. That is to say, you know, a few of these were actually successful enough that the venture capitalists think, okay, now we're ready to give them 30, 40, 50 million. And, and so that, that's the usual thing. So that, that's, that's good. You want to see that. Um, so that's one. So, and again, they're pretty knowledgeable. Who's more knowledgeable than VCs? So they're, they're, who, who would you trust even more? Your banker? <laughs> Sorry, apologies to the bankers in the room. Um, who's got better, who's got, who do you think's got great insight into where this is all going? The entrepreneurs, yeah, yeah. User, ah, users, you think you, um, well. So you, ah, could be government. Could be government, they definitely, yes, all right, so I will, Give my answer. Um, yes, uh, USA, China, eh, governments, um, big tech companies. Okay, so the people sitting at Google and Amazon and Tencent and Alibaba have really privileged information because they're not one user. They see millions and millions, if not billion users. They have incredible R&D budgets. They have so much of the talent. And they're running experiments. So this is so a lot. I mean, in fact, one of the biggest problems, problems potentially, in the digital economy is the power that is concentrated in these companies. In fact, another really interesting question is: all this AI and machine learning stuff, is it going to reinforce that, or will we somehow disrupt these big players? So anyway, just to say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, this is just to reinforce your point. This is going back to the um, entrepreneurship data. This is showing that over time, although the US dominated early, it's really a global phenomenon. And if you look where the big money is outside the US, definitely China. However, this shows you AI, especially machine learning acquisitions, just the acquisitions, because those are pretty visible, by these big tech companies. And again, if you, if you looked at them, um, they're super active. And again, they're going to be active early, right? And in fact, this is kind of, you know, I think when the history of our age is written about what we're living through, the way technology is transforming consumer experience, the way it just becomes central to business, I think there'll be a long chapter on Steve Jobs. Right, and it's not, I mean, it's partly the products um, from the Mac to the iPhone, but it's also his approach to technology. It just had an ability to see where it was gonna go. Um, do, does anyone remember when Siri came out? People, uh, it was made fun of, it was too soon in a way. 
but that acquisition was done shortly before Steve Jobs passed away. That was probably his last strategic bet. So sitting there, 2010, Steve Jobs, you know, made a bet on Siri. And if you think about it, at the time, many people laughed at it and made fun of it and look at it now. But anyway, by, just notice, by 14, 15, just a frenzy. And what's going on there is well, a couple things. But one is they realized how powerful this was, right? Um, well, I mean, I got just, just so many examples, but you're sitting there at YouTube. How do you make money at YouTube? Advertising, Advertising. for which you need what? Eyeballs. Okay, so how do you, so now, you someone stumbled, you know, saw a link, social media, I clicked on something, I watched a YouTube video. Okay, that's great. There's an advertiser before it, after it. First of all, as we know, AI is going to be amazing at figuring out what's the best ad to throw in front of you. That's, that's what the whole battle is with Facebook and stuff is. But what else is, what else do you want to do if you're YouTube? What's the next video I show you? And right, I mean just, what is it worth to YouTube with billions of people if I can show you a video that you're 10% more likely to click on? Boom, suddenly 10% more revenue. And what they're sitting, these, they're seeing that these algorithms are delivering, right? And, and so they're going in heavy, and we'll talk about it. So that's, so again, smart money going in. Um, and obviously now, you know, following, but you start to have a lot of the traditional players going in heavy. So this is Kroger, the leading um, grocer in the US, huge player, um, scared obviously about Amazon coming in and investing heavy in AI. Again, having missed e-commerce um, and, and other things, they're not, they're not going to make that mistake. And, and so it's, it's sort of, you're just seeing investment across all these categories. Um, and yes, lurking behind, there's a defense establishment that thinks the stakes in AI could also be pretty, pretty big. Um, and I'll skip this just for time. Okay, any um, questions on that? So, you know, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a couple comments on that. So yeah, you'd want to put that in context. These are, these are a pretty big wave. Um, and, and the second thing is that's just the, the, v, the venture capital money. What's harder to see, it's not as public, is the big budgets coming out of those big tech companies. You know what I'm saying? So, so the, the, the money, so I'm looking at the acquisitions by the big tech companies because I can, I can see that more easily. But yeah, yes. Mm -mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, with more time, you would look at, you would want to benchmark against other things. But I would still say my impression, so again, that um, at least when I talk to these companies, AI is the biggest thing. So when you talk to Google, they really say, we're a machine learning company. When you talk to Microsoft, Satya, it's cloud, and we're now AI first. So, so still, if I just look at the, the Discord, you know, you know, they may have other things that they're kind of into depending on where they sit, but still across that top tier big tech companies, it seems from what I can see that AI is at the top of many of their strategy imperatives. Other comments or questions? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So let's. So what do I? Um, um, so what I've been doing to try and get at that is again at, at a at a high level. It, you know, value isn't created at this sort of you know abstract level. It's really created in particular industries by particular products and companies. 
So really, what I find interesting, and I'll share about you a little bit, is just to go look at different industries, like health, like retail, and go in and look at what companies are actually doing and saying and talk to people and figure out industry by industry or use case by use case what's working. So, um, so I'll do, let's, so I'm gonna do something on health. So let's just focus on, so just to say at the big level, retail would be one of the places where it's just been phenomenal. Recommendation engines, pricing stuff, just all over the place. Finance, to some extent as well. Other sectors, manufacturing, lots of hype, lots of proof of concepts. People aren't scaling it up. So again, so it's the right question. Let's talk about medicine. What's your impression? Is there's a few people from like Cleveland Clinic. Has there been a lot of hype about AI and medicine, right? You know, and one of the like the Watson, they 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 went out there like, we've sent Watson to medical school. And he's gonna be able to better, you know, um, um, diagnose than, than, than a doctor. How has that gone? Yeah, I mean, I've been in Watson, actually, they built the entire building in Cleveland in Ohio to, for example, let's say a patient has a long history, follows for many, many years. They can stroll through hundreds of visits, just get you out instead of doctors just reading and missing out on diagnosis and missing the information. And telemedicine, I guess you're going to talk about it. So there's been a lot of talk about it, but from a, and there's been some great proof of concepts. You'll see, you'll see things written, I, um, DeepMind also from Google. But like Watson, I think they've largely, as a business, Watson Health is largely bust, right? They laid off, I think, most of the early people, right? And again, it's, it's a little bit, what did they, I mean, how does that sound? You're gonna go in, who's powerful in the medical profession? Doctors. <laughs> Is, is the medical, have, is there a good track record of the medical community adopting innovations? How long did it take you guys to adopt electronic medical records? Like forever, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of vested interest. It's not, it's not an easy place to drive change. No, but, and if, but thanks to medical technology, you know, yeah. all of us now are in very good health, good life, and all of these things early in our lifespan was 40 years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's annoying. Really, really, so, okay. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. So there's certain. So, so I think. So again, my 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 take on the medical field. So for sure, it's incredibly scientific and medically on, on terms of treatment, but in terms of changing processes and and the, a whole sort of the classic what we think of as digital transformation, has been much harder. So, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. so let me. Mm -hmm. So let me. So I asked around to try and see. Okay, who's got use cases that are scaling today? Like I, I get that there is so much data there, and 20 years from now or 30 years from now, that data plus machine learning is going to do amazing things. But who's actually in real medical systems with real doctors and real payers actually deploying AI today to create value? That's a very different question. So anyway, I'll show you one case that I, I and again, lots of disappointment. Right, so, I, so just lots of disappointment. So here's an example of you know, where is this, this working? So let's take, so the way I look at this usually is I'm trying to understand the industry environment of which AI is a piece, but the key thing is you, how does AI fit in everything else that's going on? At the end of the day, strategy, usually the best way to think about it uh, at the kernel, what is that value proposition you're bringing to market? 
and, and how is the technology feeding into that? And then something about, well, how do you actually execute on your value proposition? Okay, okay. so if we look at the medical industry, you know, just some things, tends to be highly regulated conservative. It makes, for certain types of change, it's really hard. On the other hand, you've got this incredible motor, which is you've got escalating healthcare costs. So th there's a huge amount of pressure on the system that should be pressuring us for more efficient um, treatments. So what, what I look at is telemedicine. So this is, well, you, you'll see, but this is talking to a doctor over the phone. And in the US context, we'll see why the US is, is key. But all the, you know, the, the payers love it. So there's like the, the case we'll look at MD Live. There are like 30 million eligible patients. But in this case, behavior is very hard to change. You know, I'm sick. I'm used to going and seeing my doctor. I'm not used to like having him or her on the phone. So that's, that's that kind of situation. So um, again, when, when you, you look at the value proposition, it's just like the st you know, standard strategy. What, what are you doing to costs, right, obviously? And what are you doing for what we call the willingness to pay, the, ben the value of the benefits you deliver? You know, and in principle, like a lot of new technologies, you know, if I have to sell it to you, I can tell a great story. I can say, telemedicine, it's amazing, right? How many, I talked to you about, have you ever had to wait to get to see a doctor? What do you have, you ever get sick like on, on the weekend? It's a pain. Imagine that you can just call up a doctor on the phone and you know, anytime, any place. Sounds really convenient. Not only that, I can take, especially in the US, you got a lot of people in rural places. They can access doctors more or less all over the country. Resource pooling, I can have one doctor serving big areas and be fully utilized. And again, the key thing in the US, obviously if you know the US system, it's got a lot of perversions. One of the perversions is the um, emergency rooms are a mess and hugely overpriced. So again, the huge thing, if I'm a payer, if I can get my people that I'm insuring out of those damn emergency rooms and on the phone, wow. So that's, that's, that's how it sounds so good. But again, forget AI for a second. The issue is, as I said, the payers are putting this in, but there's a huge sensitivity. I can't force you to talk to a doctor on the phone because that's going to just freak people out. There's going to be incredible resistance. So I can't force, and so I'm having trouble with adoption. Um, and, and so people, the behavior change. And so the companies are, are, this all sounds good, but they're spending a ton of money trying to market and activate their service. And so then, the, the, so for me, you know, when you, when you think about AI, it's not just, you know, this is the whole Steve Jobs thing. Don't start with the technology and the cool stuff it can do. I mean, obviously, that's sort of there. Start with your understanding of the business and the real problems that need to be solved and ask yourself, can AI do that? Because again, the, the, the trick is, of course, you have a vision that in the long term, AI is going to do a whole bunch of stuff. But if your first three projects fail, <laughs> you're not going to be around. <laughs> right? The point is your strategy is all about picking the right early wins, the, the wins you can make, build capability, credibility, experience, and then move on in a sequence. So you'll, you'll see that here. So, okay, MD Live, as I said, um, one of many players, competitive market, but they do have like 30 million customers signed up, but they're only doing like 750,000 consults a year with a network of about 1,300 doctors. Um, venture financing, pretty good financing because it's, it's a long-term play, um, but they, they have that adoption plan. So, of course, you know, this is, if you look on their website or their, they're talking about all this stuff, 24-hour um, care. This is really important, right? How long, I'm not really sure about using, you know, I'm calling a doctor on the phone. If I have to wait 20 minutes, I'm probably gonna hang up. So for them, how fast, I mean again, it's kind of crazy, because I might wait for an hour at the emergency room, but I'm gonna hang up after 10 minutes. So that's, that's, that's really important behavior. And the second thing is, again, in the medical, you're always worried about both your patient and your payer. And so again, here, 
They have a whole, I mean, they have, you know, SLA, you know, they, they have um, SLAs they have to deliver on on these contracts. They have dashboards with their payers. But those dashboards will say stuff like patient wait times, NPS scores, so all that kind of stuff the payers are looking at. That's, that's their world. Okay, so what they do, what I like about what they do, unlike some of the Watson stuff, is they're not gonna, they don't touch the doctor. <laughs> they're not gonna go in and tell the doctor, hey, guess what, you know, <laughs> we're gonna make you superfluous. They're gonna actually start with one, their first problem was simply scheduling of doctors. Right, so not, a, you know, but, but, but why does that matter? That matters a lot. <laughs> Right? I mean, you need to know at three, you know, 2 a.m. on Thursday, do I need 10 doctors or 20 doctors? And it matters for your costs, and it matters for the wait time. So it's, it's like a first order value creation thing. And so again, this is not gonna be like the fanciest, we'll get some, you'll see more fancy stuff coming, but this is gonna be, you know, souped up kind of demand estimation, regression stuff, with some algorithms for wait time. Let's do, you know, you know, whatever you think about the math, um, that's not the problem. What, what, just for those who know this, so the algorithms, although they look intimidating, you can more or less find people like this who will understand this <laughs> and implement it. Right, so that's it. He's great, but we've already got one of him. What, what don't we, what's the bigger problem? It's not just the data scientist, what do I need? So we're gonna get the, I need the data, the right data. So again, what the, I mean, the standard thing, so the first thing to know is yeah, the data is the bottleneck. And it's easy to, you know, people will tell you about all the data in the world, and there is a ton of data, but it's not necessarily ready to run these models on. So anyway, just to give you a flavor, so again, in their case, they're, they're, they, and again, one of the reasons why you see a lot of the AI stuff coming out of big tech, out of digital players, is because they tend, because they're digital natives, they tend to have better data structures. So in this case, yes, they really did have pretty good records on you know, day by day, hour by hour, what were the number of calls. But even then, right, I mean, was the, were there errors in the data? So there's still a lot of work. But, but then, in addition, you need other kinds of data. So like in this case, um, like a huge driver of this is flu. So you need data scientists who are gonna take you know, historical data and really understand what's happening with flu. So you'd have things like by age group, um, you know, what, what's been happening with flu this season. Um, Walgreens runs a really big data set on flu by, by, by location, and so they do all that. You might say, why, but I thought it was like one big national pool. Why do I have to worry about Texas? <laughs> Medicine is regulated. You cannot, if you're a doctor in the US, well, you're, you're not a doctor in the US. You've got to be registered in every state <laughs> that you practice. Most doctors are registered in three to four states. So think about it. if you're scheduling doctors, you've got a national pool, but when you add someone, they can cover five states. Hugely complicated. So, okay, so one big thing. In, in, in these AI strategies is you need data, but this is on, on the behavioral side, just because you know, you brilliant data scientist, you've solved the problem, you've got great predictions about how many people are gonna call, how is that, that, that has to get used by somebody, right? Over here, there's the department that schedules doctors. And so one of the big things is how do you actually get the information used into the organization. So the example here is there's a whole set of tools, right? So this is, this is actually showing, you know, look, market by market, time by time, what the cover, that's, that's too complicated. There are higher level tools, the scheduler can click, let's go see Texas, boom. And as they, as they call up and line up doctors, they can start to see how they're hitting their wait time targets. Um, but again, one, I mean, many, many messages there, data is important. But you have to see this, the AI machine learning stuff usually is part of a whole digital strategy, digital toolbox. It's all got to be, be worked together. Um, so that's, um, boom. Is that okay? Is this what you were expecting? Sort of. You didn't know what to expect. But. So 
okay, no one's left yet, so we'll keep going. Um, so what about, so that was, that was kind of like, I wouldn't say a quick win, that took a long time to execute and build the tools, but that was basic. What, where would you go next? So this is what they did. So this is, um, if you look on like online reviews, right, gonna be important if you're driving adoption. So you know, you can see these guys are pretty good. They've got like a four star rating, 1500 reviews, but boy, there's a bunch of variants. <laughs> And there's a bunch of people who were not happy about their experience. And if you look, you know, if you look on this, felt like doctors did not listen to me. Right? So the classic problem is you call, you know what meds you want, <laughs> and the doctor, you know, is disappointing you. And it just leads, to, you know, not all medical visits go that well. Um, bedside manner is not always that perfect for all doctors. And imagine, now it's a virtual interaction. So even worse. In this case, you know, what have they done? Because they're, remember, they're trying to drive adoption. So just like anyone in a service business, okay, we got a bad review, reply, and oh, let's call. It's a little late now, right? right? The, the, the review is posted. The person's already, they filled out their MPS score. They said that was shitty. What would you like to do if you're MD Live? Right? What is, what, is, what is machine learning great at? Prediction, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But it's basically the core of a lot of the machine learning is predicting stuff. Can you, would you be able to predict when someone hangs up the phone whether they're happy or not? Turns out, and I'll show you, I mean, boom. I mean, they have, if once you pull it together, you know why they called, how long they waited, what, all the demographic information on them and the doctor. You know not only what the doctor did, but you have all the, the, the soap notes. The, the doctor makes a whole bunch of notes. You have just like a whole wealth of information on that interaction. Even, you can obviously with natural language processing, the whole script can be quickly encoded and analyzed. And, and the magic of machine learning is it can take just incredible amounts of data, build models to predict stuff. And in this case, it's not, you can imagine, if you, if you had all that data, um, and, and it's a good data scientist, you can pretty much figure out who hung up and is pissed off. That's pretty cool. So that, and now, of course, then the issue is, well, what do you do with it? Well, boom, they, this is rolling out right now, you've got a whole bank of phone operators running your system. And you suddenly say, whoa, you know, Miss Smith here, well, she waited 63 minutes, and there was a bunch of other problems, we think she's going to be pissed. You give her a call. <laughs> and again, you, you, you have to, but again, you have to build a whole system, a set of processes that, that that's, you know, has the data going in, organized, has the prediction, and then actually builds the organization that can, can deliver on it. And that, that's what we see. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I clearly, depending on the jurisdiction, this stuff gets you know more and more complicated. And again, it it typically comes down. This is in the U.S., so at least you're not dealing with um, GDPR. But yeah, it comes down to the kind of consents people have given. So well, there's going to be two sides. What's legal, and the second side is, um, you know, what's what's ethical and what might cause trouble for you. Um, again. Um, a lot of it is, if, if we leave aside the legal concern, I'm not an expert on legal, so I, I'm not gonna be able to say anything more than check with your lawyer on that. But from a customer relationship point of view, you wanna ask, what do they see, right? And so obviously people start to figure out, well, shit, what the hell, you know, Facebook is stalking me, and I can see pretty clearly they're serving up these ads, and I know what they're doing. You have to ask here, okay, well what, and this is, what's the patient experience if I've had a bad interaction with a doctor and somebody calls me, how do I make sure that they, their experience of that is, oh, the company cares, they've seen something, and how do I make sure their experience isn't, were you listening in? And, but again, it's, but it's exactly right. It's, it's, that's, that's part of what you have to manage. I, I liked your comment about it. the behavior. Again, what you, you typically, the reason I usually don't get too deep into technology is technology in most cases is only 20% of the game. 
you know, the, over and over again, the other 80% is, well, whatever the technology's done, how did you build the whole business system around it? Um, and, and there's definitely a, a part of that here. All right, that's good. And again, we, again, this is still, where could this go? This is not where they are today. But can you imagine, right, this is, I mean, a big part, I think one of the big phrases you hear that I think makes a lot of sense is sort of man plus machine. So again, don't necessarily always just be thinking, how am I going to disrupt humanity? How can I make people better? And so here, but you know, it, you know, clearly, you know, it, there's the doctor. <laughs> You're going to be able to have systems that can alert the doctor, hey, this person in front of you is getting frustrated. And not only that, probably you can build systems that could suggest, okay, okay, they're getting frustrated because they think they need this medication, and they don't. Why don't suggest, try saying this. Right, so you can, you can imagine a whole set of augmented stuff. But again, to get to there, the data scientists there have to solve some of the simpler problems first. And that's, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah, so again, well, part of, so you, what you notice, what they're not doing is necessarily doing the treatment, actually. You'd think, like, the core is, you know, do I prescribe, what do I prescribe? Um, again, there's a there's couple of issues. Well, well, later on I'll talk about, well, I mean, the short answer is just think about some of the legal issues if something goes wrong. So, again, even if it's statistically more accurate, what we know is, any mistake by the machine is going to get socially amplified. And, and, and so it's not necessarily the right place to start. It, it may be too, especially in a sector like health, right? Super sensitive. Health, life and death, that's probably not the place to play around until it's more socially accepted. Really important. Anyway, that's it. Um, this just, you know, again, at the end of the day, what are we doing? It's like, we're trying to create more value with AI. It's got to be linked here. Improved wait times. We know that's really important. The fact that they had better scheduling moved those metrics for them in a significant way. Not only that, but doctors, you know, if I'm sitting, I'm, they're basically getting paid by the call. And if I've signed up and I end up sitting by the phone, it doesn't ring, I'm not so happy. Whereas if I get my scheduling right, the doctors are always so happy. So you can just see that. Um, I don't know how old was it. Um, I prepared too much, so that's okay. We'll get it through as much as we can. This is just, again, I'm not going to lecture on machine learning. I imagine some of you have seen lectures on machine learning, but maybe just talk a little bit about the technology in some way. So, um, I mean, the key, I mean, there's lots of different parts of AI, but one of the, the key things that, that causes the explosion of interest is a big, um, adoption of machine learning, so the ability of machines to learn, right? So that's, that's sort of the core here. That's the math. So again, you absolutely have to understand this before you can do anything, right? No, that's not true, right? So let's, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. But why, what, what, how, how would I think about this? Okay, so what was the, pr the biggest wave before this was probably the whole cloud-based mobile app, right? So, so all of us, if you're in, I mean, I don't know, how many people have been involved in a company that's launched some sort of app? Right, but I mean, something, I mean, INSEAD, we have apps. I mean, you know, so it, it's, it's pretty common. Like, lots of people have worked on teams that have created or tried to create real business value with an app. How many of those people understand how a cell phone works? And if you open up a cell phone, there's like a lot of stuff in there. There's like probably, I don't know, I'll go out on a limb. There's probably nobody on the planet who understands each piece of that, <laughs> right? Because I mean, each of them, there's all sorts of specialized parts. Everyone's like super specialized um, in, in whatever their technology is. But what you need, you know, but again, if you're working on, you know, a, a retail bank app, you had to have enough of an understanding of what the technology could or couldn't do. And, and, and so that where it was going and some things about how some of the functionality would change over the next few years. So you, you absolutely want to build some sort of a high level understanding of the technology. Again, 
if you, you know, going somewhat deep on the technology will help. Um, but again, also finding the people who are deep into it and talking and, and starting to, to try and see how they think about it, you're, you're, this is all what you're doing. Um, so let me just go ahead. So here's, so again, there's, and there's not, in terms of building a high level mental model, like there's not the one mental model. It's usually there's a bunch of different things that are useful. I will share one thing I find useful. <laughs> so this is, this is part of my mental model, and for those who are experts, if, if you think there's a flaw in my mental model, let me know. Um, but classic computing, what we've been living through up to now was about what? We've got data, I hire a bunch of software programmers who write code and will take that data and they'll give me some outcomes. Right? So they'll, they'll write code, they'll say, okay, enter, if the patient has these systems, then we predict this, and they'll, they'll do that. All that. Or, um, you know, it's, it's this customer um, and they bought that, we suggest let's recommend this to them. That's, that's classic. What machine learning does is actually disrupt this. It's a different approach, which is just this. Boom! Did you see that? Right? So it, 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 it basically starts with data and the outcomes that go with the data. That's the sort of the classic machine learning. And the computer then cranks through the data and the outcomes and essentially figures out what the program should be. And, and that's, um, that's it. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a simplified, wow, again, there, there's a lot behind it, but that's a big change. And again, the first thing to note is actually machines aren't that smart, right? It, they are doing this with brute force, really. It, it is brutal. Um, in, in most applications, you need a lot, a lot of data. You want to teach a computer to you know, recognize skin cancer. You want a lot, a lot of pictures of, of skin cancers and non-skin cancers. And you actually want a ton of computing power, it turns out. And, and so that's, that's a big piece of it. And, um, and so then, oh, well, anyway, so, so this is the classic, you know, if you, again, I want, you know, if you look at, you know, it's, it's all, the core of it is all about showing computers these labeled, whether it's, um, well, images are classic, but, but, but anything. It could be, you know, did this person repay their loan or not? And the computer's going to try and figure out what's an apple, what's a, um, a, a good borrower. They're going to look, basically look for patterns. It's all about correlations. It's all, it's kind of like a big giant regression thing, but super complicated. And again, well, I won't go through this, but you probably, if you dig into this, you'll, you'll see all this kind of stuff, and you'll see why there's just like, insane amounts of power and, and why you actually need, this is actually, it's, it's not completely a science, it's a bit of an art. You need data scientists to muck around and make this work, as far as I know. Is that true? That's kind of true. <laughs> Close enough. And again, and the whole thing is, it's, fundamentally it's about predictions. You're gonna show them all those, say, photos or all those loans and, and what happened and then at the end it's gonna build this program you're gonna say, hey, here's something new, what's that? And it's gonna say, hey, yeah, that's an apple. Probably. <laughs> it's very precise. It's like a computer. It'll, it'll say, yeah, that's, that's almost certainly an apple. And then you're going to show it this. And is it going to know? Well, is it going to know? What? It's, it's, it's going to depend. Did you show it data of sliced fruit or not? Right? So if you've shown it, you know, if you, if you fed it data of sliced, so same thing, classic thing. If you, all of your data was about like men, and whether they pay, repay loans, and suddenly a woman walks in, you know, it, it's going to be confused. <laughs> um, and same thing, it depends on the data, right? And, and that's just, just remember that. Okay, and then really quickly, um, why now? Why, why is, because again, if we ask, <laughs> what, what was that? Oh, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> depends on the data, I don't know. You know see? He's a good data scientist, where's that number? You know the the other number? I made that up. So just just it, it, that's that's the difference between a strategy professor and a data scientist, <laughs> right there. Um, why why is it happening now? So again, are these fundamentally new techniques, machine learning? Right. As soon as you talk to anyone in the field, like oh come on, we've been doing this has been around forever. There's nothing new. Well, yeah, there are some new things, but so it's not that. Why why is it taking off now? 
amount of data, right? So, so clearly, so, so two pieces. The biggest piece is probably all this digital transformation has piled up data. And again, this is, this is just the cost of a gigabyte of storage. Right? So, so also, storage has become almost free. So there's just like piles and piles and piles of data. Might or might, might, not, or might not be organized, but it's out there. And then, but the other, and then again, all the devices and, and other things coming. So that's fine. But the second thing is computer power. Same thing, computing power. This is the cost of a million transistors. You know, I was at Stanford in the early 90s. We thought the PC was pretty cool, but you know, a million transistors cost you $500. Now it's pennies. And this is a good one, because again, I, we talked about timing. If you went back 10 years and you asked experts in machine learning, did they think in general that this was about to be the golden age of AI, they didn't really see it coming, most of them. Right? There was a surprise, which often happens. It's just, and again, the surprise was this. <laughs> so what was happening was all, how many people you know, played PC video games growing up? Right? And spent, you know that money you spent? It's your fault. This whole AI thing, it's because of you. Because you were so, you, you wanted to escape reality, and you wanted games that were more and more realistic. Because you couldn't deal with reality because you were some, like, probably some teenage boy. And so you got this money, and this company called NVIDIA like, poured billions of dollars into making graphic processors, which were very good at doing the sort of manipulations you need to do virtual, you know, these, these kind of, these kind of graphics. Anyway, turns out, apparently, that that hardware was also good at the type of calculations that you need for a lot of this machine learning. And so one of the things that, that ha once, once that connection was made, um, it opened up a whole, whole set of possibilities, and it, well, that's one reason it took off, kind of interesting. But because it talks about, again, just how hard it is to predict these systems. They're incredibly complicated. Even people in the middle of it don't know necessarily what's coming. It's pretty cool. Of course, today, um, you know, I mean, now it's such a big industry on its own, people are spending billions on processors just for AI, even more, you know, tailored to it. So you get that kind of positive feedback. And that's what this is about. And again, you've got, I mean, just the, the whole ecosystem around it has become big. So we talked about investment. You know, you just think of the competition that's coming between AWS, Azure, Google, Tencent. These companies are putting, you know, tens and tens of billions into building the infrastructure you need to host your data and do these calculations. So it's, you know, the idea that we're, this is going to go away is, is not true, right? There's just, there's so much money going in and in this way. Questions or comments? Okay, yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. So again, I, I yeah. yeah, yeah. So sure. So I, I do think, in addition to what I said, which is just more and more devices, more and more digital, because people are now thinking about the value of data and the fact that they would want to use it for machine learning, means that when they build their digital systems, they're paying much more attention. So I don't know, if, if you sign up today, it used to be if you, um, well, I don't know, if you go to like L'Oreal and you go to their websites, they're suddenly gonna start asking you, you know, you're, you're looking at some brand, and they're gonna say, oh, I, we've got a product recommender for you. Tell us about your skin type. What kind of pro skin problems do you have? What kind of look, you know, they're gonna ask a whole set of questions about you. Why do they do that? <laughs> At the end, they're going to make some product representations. But ultimately, everyone's racing to try and build rich data on individuals so, because they, 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 they have this belief that they can use it for this kind of machine learning. So I don't know if that is that getting at what you're saying? But 
Hm. Ja, ja. Yes, okay, that's great. If I have time, I think that's a great point. I, if I think I know what you're meaning, but y yeah, there's a whole loop you need. So I'll try and get to that. Uh, that, that that's awesome. Um, okay, so what time? We, we, what? Yeah, 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 sure. And again, you can stop me anytime, but I'll, I'll try and do another 15 and then really sh try and shut up. Okay, so just a few things to say. So really, uh, again, to to just go in, so one of the things that I, I find interesting, as I said, is, is to understand in general where the value comes, and there's a ton of value in this technology. So just, again, um, you get all these incredible predictions, they're fast, right? So you can, you can predict, um, what's one case I looked at, know your customer in banking. All these regulations, should I let you send, I mean, especially from this region. People in this region get screwed all the time in doing cross-border money transfers because there's, there's so much pressure on um, sort of regulation. If you can automate that with like good machine learning systems, you can make those calls much faster. So that could be great. Obviously, it can be personalized. Um, this technology obviously has been used, all this image recognition, natural language processing, there's whole systems that have built up. So wow, wow, wow. Again, the costs are going down, processing power has gotten cheap, tons of data. Um, didn't mention this, and I don't have time, but there's a great tradition among data scientists in, in machine learning that a lot of the code that's developed is put out in the public domain. So much more so than traditional software. So that, that, that makes it much cheaper. You still need a good data science to access it, but it's, there's just libraries on GitHub. So that's, that's awesome. And this is, but the danger is, you know, most technology, whether it's blockchain or VR, is going to have a great story. The problem is, especially early on, there's a lot of problems. So here's, just to make the point, electric vehicles are in the news a lot. Um, same thing, you know, this one, when Carlos Ghosn, before he got thrown in jail by the Japanese, he was a big, big proponent of electric vehicles. So he, he bet a lot on, you know, this, the LEAF, which is first mass produced. And what he said is, look, this is amazing, eco-friendly, right? huge. There's all kinds of tax credits from the government. Electric vehicles are actually much easier to maintain. And the simpler engine, it's cheaper to make the, the engines. And again, governments are pushing in, in many jurisdictions. Okay, What happens? Did it, were electric vehicles adopted? No, because again, yes, they have all that, but you know, same sort of thing. People, you know, it's a new technology, I'm nervous. I don't want to, has anyone run out of gas? Sucks, right? So, so there's a lot of, all the anxiety, um, lack of chargers. Um, again, huge costs on the batteries. Um, no, you didn't have production volume. So you had just all these negatives, um, and, and it didn't take off. What unlocked the electric vehicle? You know, there's, you know, Elon Musk is somewhat controversial, but boy, the guy has had some amazing strategic insights. And, 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 and the core of the Tesla Insight was actually the pl this technology is not ready for the mass market. The, but the Insight was, wow, I can actually create an amazing performance car. Right? Because again, if I sell to rich people, first of all, they can afford a ton of batteries. Plus, it's, you know, it turns out rich people are usually the ones more, with more anxiety about the environment. So they have more to lose. Um, and just on top of that, you know, the, the low weight of an electric vehicle and the acceleration is amazing. Right? So he, 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 you know, he, again, Elon Musk explicitly, he wants to do this. He wants to push the industry to do that. Again, same thing. That's where he wants to go. It doesn't necessarily mean in strategy that's where you start. With a new technology, there are pros and cons. You've got to pick the use cases that are going to work early on if you're going to be in the game when the real, the real money comes down the road. Same thing here. Um, you know, so, what's the, there's a, so you've got to be aware, amazing things about AI and a lot of problems not yet solved, like privacy. What's this one? If you ask, and again, if you ask a computer to learn versus current images, who's in the kitchen? What's the computer going to tell you? Who's in the kitchen? Women. Because that's what we show them. Um, 
This is another one, Google. Google, one of the most sophisticated machine learning people. You go, this, I did this, I don't know, maybe they fixed it, but a few weeks ago, um, you know, you go on, I'm translating to Turkish, she's a mother. Okay, boom. Let's go back, okay. Blah, 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 she's a mother. No problem. What happens if I say she's a doctor? What happens if I translate that back? That's right, he's a doctor. You will see Google, when they do like their auto suggestions for emails, they are gonna avoid anything that might have gender issues. Um, Amazon, for years apparently, worked on an automated resume screening program. Right? They've hired lots and lots of engineers, lots of data. They abandoned it because they felt they couldn't get gender bias out. And again, so they're, anyway, so just, um, so you, again, when you go in, it's not necessarily, you don't need to understand all the depth necessarily, but you've got to understand the strengths and the weaknesses so you don't trip up on, on the weaknesses. And again, it's a moving target. There are people working on these problems, right? So just because, you know, it's not solved today doesn't mean in two years it won't be solved. So you just gotta, gotta watch that. So again, data privacy we brought up. Um, again, it, the, the issue is, again, when you, when you actually go in, if you haven't done and you look at it, the actual models are incredibly complicated. So, so most of them aren't transparent. I mean, you, you can do things at a high level and say, no, no, I don't want to set insurance rates based on the color of your skin. But if I include in my model the neighborhood you li live in and a few other things, I've effectively included the color of your skin. And, and again, the issue is, you know, if you're a bank and you're determining who gets loans and who doesn't, and at some point, you know, there's an article in the, the, the paper and someone's run data and showed that you're biased, that, that, that could hit you. So you got, you know, just be, be aware of those things, bias. Um, Again, I think though the biggest, so that though those are important, but you know, the, this issue of getting the data, preparing the data is, is a big issue. Um, talent. Okay, let's, so that's, and again, so, well, okay, this is a sad one, but what's this? Now we remember the apple with the slice. So um, a lot of the excitement, remember all the excitement about, well, excitement about self-driving cars, which is still, still coming, but it had a, hit a big bump in the road. But, but basically there's an accident in Arizona um, with Uber, anyway, they, they, they're training data, had had lots of people on bikes, lots of pedestrians, not so many people walking their bike. And so the car, you know, had a, you know, hit and killed somebody. Um, but just, and again, but you know, and it, that's, that had a noticeable chill on the industry. And again, from a purely rational point of view, it doesn't make much sense. Cars kill so many people. So it's just horrible. But again, in this context, when a machine, you know, people freak out when a machine does this. Partly because we're kind of feeling threatened and let's, well, okay, let's, right? So um, you, you, you have to be, again, it's, it, it's not just, you know, especially today with technology, what I've noticed is it used to be, I used to teach, okay, understand the technology, understand your business and how you create value. Still have to do all that. But increasingly, you also have to think about the bigger social context, right? The emotions and the politics around technology are actually quite big. And, and you have to have that broader view as well. AI is definitely fueling that. And, and so again, it's, you know, it's all, if we get into the organization, it's all about diversity, right? It's, it's you, you need a group of people forming your strategy. You need people who understand the technology. You need people who understand the industry and the business value drivers. But you also need people who understand the regulation, the social contracts, the, the ethics. Um, and, and you need somehow, for, for, like for INSEAD, people who can pull all that diversity together. I think for, for us, that, that's really key. Um, boom. And, and again, just last thing, is there are tons and tons of um, use cases. So this is really a general purpose technology. Almost any function, um, any industry, you can, you can think about things it can do. Um, there's, there's a wealth of um, possibilities. 
But again, a lot of the strategy is in your company, in your industry, what do you think the place to start is that'll really drive value in the short run? Okay, the, just to, I, why don't I pause there and um, yeah, just see what kind of questions you have for me. I warn you, if you don't ask questions, I got like more slides, so. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so, yeah, 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 please. No. AI, uh, like disruption education and regulation. Hmm. So, um, so, um, so, okay, quick comment. So education, here's my thought on education. Um, slow, so it's education is like healthcare. Um, it, 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 they're complex systems. A lot of naive people come in, and, and actually getting the change management is hard. Um, if we look at the current wave, so all the sort of online education MOOC type stuff, big hype, big crash, but it's playing out like e-commerce. So like a couple percent a year, you know, bit by bit, you see it diffusing. Um, so, I'd, so based on that, I'd expect something similar in education. I think here very much you're talking about machine plus human. So you're really thinking about systems that would sort of enhance and empower the teacher. Right, so like the classic things that people say that makes sense to me is, okay, if I've got good data on what kids are doing, can I, can I have systems that will alert a, prof a teacher to a student who's, who's likely to get getting into trouble so the teacher can spend more time with them? Again, if you think about education, I mean, yeah, the content matters, but there's so much about role modeling and mentoring and soft things and motivating that I don't think you want to rip good teachers out of that system. You want to make them better. So I'd say, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Do you think like legacy courses fail in Um, I think that's one of the most interesting questions, and general and digital, right? So the whole, again, context, the whole big consumer internet thing, right? All from search to social media, the incumbents just failed and failed and failed, right? So it all went to the new company. So we're always asking, okay, is it going to be different now? Um, yes and no. Um, again, I'll talk about, maybe I, I will do a few slides on this. Clearly, this is enhancing some of the dominance of the big internet players, making them even more fearsome. At the same time, a lot of traditional companies do still sit on data. And, and a lot of, actually, if you look at a lot of the AI stuff, it, you got to get pretty deep into the vertical. Right? If you're really going to go in and do preventive maintenance, it's not really Google DeepMind guys just brilliantly sitting there in London. You, you've really got to get closer. And, and so one of the things we, we do tend to see now is, again, big companies are slowly changing. And in particular, they're, they're getting better at working with smaller companies. So, so overall, I, I start to think you're starting to see settings where every, you know, startups and big companies have a common threat, which is you know, the Amazons and the Alibabas. And you see them working together better. And so there, there are definitely going to be certain places where that model will work pretty well. Um, but yeah, here, yeah. Just, thank you. It's just a comment, and I'd like to, to yeah, please. think about it. Just to, to Victor's point, the, the flip side of it is, uh, if you look at this, Phil Parker, is mm. the ve velocity of data acquisition, 80s, 90s, 80s and 90s, very slow to pick up data, et cetera. But if any company, big, small, startup, even legacy, right now, if they latch onto the right idea, digitize, and get adopted, yeah. They pick up data in a month. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. So, what, what's your take on the the value of the speed of data acquisition here? Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So there is a big concern that this is creating a lot of positive feedbacks and winner take all. So yeah, I, I would definitely either. I mean, in some settings, this is just going to power ahead the Googles and the Facebooks and the Alibabas. In other settings, one or two industrial players have an opportunity to now pull ahead. But it's, it's, it, it is, a, this tends to be a winner-take-all technology. So maybe I'll, let me just elaborate on that. So again, this is not new, right? With digital, we've seen 
sort of winner-take-all markets and platforms a lot. Like the early, you know, I'll go super fast, but the whole Windows thing when I was growing up, right? A lot of people adopt it. I have a big installed base. Lots of people develop software for it in the old software days. Therefore, wow, that's what you need for value creation. Therefore, lots of people adopt Windows. Can't beat it. Steve Jobs, for all of his brilliance, once he lost it, he couldn't beat it. And that's why he ended up doing other things. Um, again, Alibaba. Why is Alibaba dominating commerce in China and elsewhere? Critical mass. So it's the same thing. Again, Alibaba, more so than Amazon, is a platform. Right? They, they, they form themselves to empower small and medium businesses in China. They don't compete with them. They create a platform. Same thing, just huge number of sellers, huge number of buyers. And it's just, you know, JD kind of tries to hold on. But it's, it's, it's tough. And on top of that, digital is a big fixed cost game. Right, so Alibaba is investing in things like Alipay, all kinds of services that reinforce this. And so it's just incredibly positive feedback. Let me just finish and oh, go ahead. Uh, right, so I mean, well, one thing is indeed, given these positive feedbacks, you see incredible power being concentrated in these big companies. This happened as well in, you know, the reason we have antitrust laws is when there was original industrial revolution, companies like Standard Oil in the US controlled what was the oil of the time, which was oil. And <laughs> there's a point where, right, business and society, at some point, society, you know, business requires society for a license to operate. And there's a huge, your biggest risk to a Facebook today is more regulation rather than competition. Okay, last thing though, this is really important, and I think this, I don't know, I, I've talked to Phil some, but I don't know exactly how he frames it, but the way I'd frame it, AI definitely is adding to these positive feedback. Right? So the idea is if I got a lot of customers, I get their data. If I'm good, especially if I'm a digital business, it's all well organized. Now I've got this miracle thing, AI, especially machine learning, run that data through, if I can find the ways, again, in my industry, like we talked about with YouTube, or like with other predictions for e-commerce, if I can turn that data and machine learning into new value creation, I can beat the competition, bring in more customers, positive feedback. And on top of that, what the other thing you see, if I'm Google, oh my god, I'm making so much money, what I really need is, it's all about talent, and again, talent is attracted by money, and by data, right? So if I'm a, there's a real, if you, if you look at that community, the data scientists tend to have a sort of a, a stronger academic um, research orientation. And again, they, they want to make a lot of money, but they also want to do, they want to they make Star Trek happen. <laughs> they they want to make the science fiction happen. And again, so you, you see that and, and companies like Google um, just sopping up talent. Um, and, and so that, th those double things. So yeah, I don't. Is that? So so it's yeah. So, so the question is, the question is, what breaks this? Or is this, <laughs> is this Microsoft Windows? Yeah. Um, I, I I you know I pro you know probably the way it's going, it would have to get broken probably by government. In most, I mean, they're, they're just these th these companies are just such. Just bad. But again, it'll it'll depend. Yeah, on, in, in their core areas. Like so, yeah, if you wanna, it's gonna be very hard to compete in e-commerce. But again, that doesn't mean that there's gonna be parts of AI around, you know, like operations and factories. And you know, if ABB, Siemens, and it's not necessarily, there, there are gonna be other players who've got an installed set of equipment who can, who can do this in, a, in, in their area. Banks and financial services, but again, yes, although, like in China, Ant, you know, Alibaba, you know, Ant Financial is going to probably be a winner there. Most other markets are still pretty wide open. Um, but this is definitely one of the things that's driving this revolution is people realize they're early winner take all early mover. So people are rushing. And it's not always going to work. But um, that, that's part of what's making this hard to stop. Yeah, please. 
Mm. Yeah, say it, just it's a chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's a good, yeah. So um, or the European. Well, what do the Europeans do? Is one of the interesting questions because, as you said, the the U.S. It, I mean, at least the U.S. has the companies in their countries, sort of, um, to the extent that those countries. But um, but yeah. So from the Europeans, it's it's much more interesting. But you can see. They are starting to, to, again, the Europeans are so fragmented, but they, if they were more united, they could do some pretty interesting things. Yeah? Uh, as of today, do we have an idea of a projection where AI could take us in 20, uh, 30 years from now? Um, 20, 30, um, no, I mean, again, I, I'm, pretty, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty humble in the sense that our, our human systems are so complicated that, and, and, and we've just made things more and more complicated and we're no more smarter. It's very hard to have that vision to project even five years out. Um, but that won't stop me from speculating. So at least, so sort of smart people I talk to um, deep in the technology would say, yeah, it's, it, can, it can do a narrow set of things amazing, but some of the, the broader stuff um, is not there yet. So th in that sense, the, the fear that it's going to just make us obsolete in, in, in 20 years, not without some other substantial breakthrough, I don't know, some sort of quantum computing or something like that. So I think this trajectory, that be my guess, will go pretty far. And, and there will be probably a bunch of job destruction, also job creation. So I'm not saying the social tensions won't be big. But um, it, it's not going to suddenly, you know, totally make us obsolete. This technology projecting 20 years. But again, I, I'm open to other views. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the healthcare industry, right? Um, there was an instance where they acquired a cancer, and clearly mm -hmm. they can see value um, of exploiting AI in the future. Yeah. But then they came to another player. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And but in particular in the future, this massive player yeah. needs to make or break the exploration of AI in the healthcare industry. Yeah. Um, I don't know from this back to for uh, governments that's been very moving ahead with exploration of AI uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. Would that be more of a light touch, or it would be more? Because in here, like for example, uh, even Benjamin would know, uh, there's already been um, a policy for AI used in healthcare. Mm. That, 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 that was one of the that was mentioned. And it doesn't really push forward. Mm. In the system. And it, yeah. Interesting. So people are getting oh. confused. Yeah. How does it apply? And does it actually answer? How do you do it? Mm. And I'm not sure. That's great. Hear from, let's hear from Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I can tell you, uh, so the narrow part, it'll yeah. work. It's working. I mm. can tell you how. So, for example, uh, in medicine, uh, we're never going to give a new appointment for a person with a new problem uh, over the app. So you come and see me in clinic. Great. You have, a pro you have a headache. We did all the imaging. I don't need to examine you anymore. All right, 90% of the things usually you can do just by talking to the patient. Then you live two hours away, or you live in Ras al-Khaim. You're not going to come back to Abu Dhabi. You do it over. And, mm -hmm. you know, co confidentiality is, I mean, it's up to the patient. He can sit at home, he can sit in a cafe. It depends to him what, what he wants to do. For us, we're in clinic, you're alone. The second one is, which we're going to probably apply in the region, you're, you treat stroke within the first four hours. For That's a particular example. Mm. After four hours, it's a done deal. You can't help the patient. So if a remote rural mm -hmm. hospital in a remote city, they have no capability and they, they have no physician, I only need a nurse to just put the Skype app. And that's actually how it works in Ohio. Yeah. Show me the patient. 
he's eligible, give him the treatment and bring him over. You don't need a doctor, you don't need resources. And this is working. And it helps a lot of our patients and cuts cost and you have better access. That's it. So I think I'll, I'll, we'll end with this. I'll, I'll, I've been reflecting a little bit, having some conversations about how this region stacks up on AI. Okay, so, because um, again, there's two parts of it. One part, if you're government, is how do you deploy AI in your services like medical? But then also, you know, to what extent can you um, build ecosystems more broadly in your economy, right? So, first of all, I mean, great example of exactly what we talked about, which is thinking, you know, well-run government with, with a lot of top-down authority, if they're smart and they pick the right use cases, can do amazing things. Um, again, if you're overconfident and you go in too broad and too early, you risk getting tainted and then you're not, a, you know, it might be only it gets harder. And that'd be the last thing, I don't know if anyone was here for, um, you know, the event, the GBLC we did in Dubai, but anyway, one of the, um, it was very really interesting. We had a very guy who's doing just amazing things, deploying AI into manufacturing and physical stuff, coming out of the U.S., but you know, spending a lot of time in this region. And it's like, yeah, in the long run, my biggest market is definitely the U.S. But I'm seeing amazing and unique opportunities in the Gulf because it's so top down, right? So, so again, you know, obviously top down has not. Uh, you know, the, the way things have tended to, to move um, has been away from sort of top-down, you know, a lot of the inner, whereas in this space, this will be our last thought, um, actually driving some of this kind of change, if you've got good leaders, um, it can be pretty powerful. And again, I, this will be one of the things that you've heard a lot about in terms of the digital age was agility, right? Who's heard about strategic agility, lean startup, you've got to experiment, which is very bottom up. It's like the top has to let go and let the organization experiment. And that doesn't necessarily play to the strengths of a very hierarchical culture. I just point out that AI is, I mean, agility is still important. It's less agile because an AI play typically means I've got to build a big data set. I got to do a lot of things to execute these strategies. It's much especially in healthcare, but, but it's much more of a tr classic strategy thing like building a big jetliner. And it, it can actually help a lot to have someone senior drive. So I was talking to somebody you know, in the education space, right? and the, the fact that you know, His Highness, the Crown Prince, you know, went and shook hands with the principal who adopted their app for teaching, it was, that's a done deal. Okay? Everybody knows, okay, that app is what I'm supposed to adopt. And again, I don't want to be you know, done well. You know, if, if you get your leaders shaking hands with the right people on the right use cases, you can actually move things um, in a way here. And, even, and, and you're seeing some of that. Um, but that's, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. I, I'm not another time. So. They wanted to hack one billion dollars. They managed to hack two billion dollars. How they did it? They did it on Saturday. They sent it to the Fed, went to the Philippines, and it went to a broker in Tajik. Why is this being done? Okay, they could manage to get to the two billion by now. Now, uh, the takeaway from this that we have seen that since we have all the information, we have the data. Yeah, we can create the business intelligence. And then you can build on top of it the machine learning. With this machine mm. learning, then if, for example, an order will come on Saturday, why the central bank will send the five star on Saturday? If it comes on the weekend, why on the weekend? Why should it go to Philippines when the central bank does not deal with the Philippines? Why should it go to a casino and then to a broker and then you know so so all of these things are based on data that is there, and then you can do the business intelligence, and then with the machine learning. You can say, okay, in the future, Saturday, there is no, then it can be stopped. Yeah. Uh, Philippines, it's stopped. The casino, it's stopped. Oh, yeah. And this is where it can be applied in every way, even for the government. You have, for example, people, you have financial transactions, 
you have uh, uh, migrant workers, you have uh, lots of facilities that are moving in and out. All of these data are everything you are having it on the store. And this is where, you know, with the business intelligence, you can see whatever is needed, where it is, where it's fraudulent activity, or where it's, you know, something abnormal that is taking place. And this is where the machine learning comes yeah. uh, handy. You know, I think of, you know, retail, financial services as places where, like you're saying, cybercrime, some of these things, uh, yeah, you just have some amazing use cases and people are getting value out now. I think Pascal is signaling, you need to end? Yes, yeah, so anyway, I'm afraid. So yeah. um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming out and uh, great questions. All right.